Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's so good to be with all of you this morning. My name is Trevor. I'm the lead pastor here at Risen, and I would love to grab pizza with you after the service. If you're new, right down the hallway in the library, it'll be a great opportunity for you to ask any questions you want about the church to get to know you. There's no pressure of anything but free, free food and a great conversation, hopefully. And I am back after being off last week. You have caught us in a just small sort of two-week series last week and then this week on parenting. And uh, next week, if you're with us, we will be beginning to walk through the book of First Peter, which I am really excited about. Um, but it's been nice this week, last week, to have Steve Snook, who was here last week. Um, if you didn't get a chance to hear Steve, man, you missed out. Steve has been a pastor and a father and a husband on the west side of Los Angeles for 40 years, and he uh, has raised three kids in the faith on the west side. He's a grandparent now. Um, he's a good friend. And last week, he talked about what he called Jesus-style parenting. And uh, I think the thing that most stood out to me in hindsight was his reminder, parents, that it is our great desire that our children would look more like Jesus than they would look like us. Amen? That's a good thing. And so I am really thankful that he was able to be with us last week. And then this week, you get me talking about how to parent like a Christian. How to Parent Like a Christian. This morning, my goal is to just talk through the basics of Christian parenting, and I will lead us through a key passage that every parent in this room should highlight. Every parent in this room should know this passage because it will speak directly to what it looks like to parent. And so if you are a parent, it is so important that you get this text. And maybe if you're here and you're not a parent, I want to remind you, you could be someday. Um, and so this sermon is also for you. But even if you will never be a parent, as a church, we firmly believe that it really does take a community to play a role in the life of our children. And so um, you will probably be an aunt or an uncle or a friend or a mentor or a teacher or a coach, and you are made to help others. So this is really for everyone this morning. And I do hope you leave blessed and strengthened in your parenting or in preparation for it. But it's also not just for parents. It's for children. You'll see that in a moment. The historian and philosopher Hannah Arndt uh, once said that every generation, our society is invaded by barbarians, and we call them children. That's what happens. Every generation of children comes in, and what we need for children are strong families because families are the essential institution for shaping our future. If we want to shape our future, you ought to care about families and the next generation. Amen? One writer put it this way. This is Michael Novak. He wrote this in The Family Out of Favor. He said that the family is the seedbed of economic skills, money habits, attitude towards work, and the arts of financial independence. The family is a stronger agency of educational success than the school. The family is a stronger teacher of the religious imagination than the church. If infants are injured here, not all the institutions of society can put them back together. I think we know intuitively that if you want to have a strong community, you want to have a strong state or a strong nation, you need to have strong families. Families are essential. And what I want you to know this morning is that the character of God is the key to parenting. A failure to understand the character of God will lead to disastrous consequences when you think about how to parent. 
And so this morning, I hope that as we unpack Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 together, you would find in it the character of God and God's instructions to you about who, how you are to parent. And for children, I hope you learn something about what does it mean to be a child as a Christian according to the Lord. If you're unfamiliar with Ephesus um, or specifically the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is a book in the New Testament where a guy named Paul, an early follower of Jesus, an apostle, is writing to that church. And when he gets to the sixth chapter, he is going to get really practical about the relationship between parents and children. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul has just finished talking about husbands and wives, about how to be married as the people of God. And now he turns his attention to the family relationship. He's talking to dads and to moms and to their believing children. And he is going to talk about the reciprocal duties that relate between parents and their children. And in this text is a little of something for everyone. So let's read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is what Paul says as he turns his attention to the Christian household. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This morning, we'll spend just a few minutes together looking at that text, and here's how I will break it down. First, we'll talk to children and what children are to do. Then we'll talk to parents and what they are not to do. And we'll close by talking to parents again on what to do. So let's begin with this first point as Paul turns his attention towards the parents and to the children, starting with the children in Ephesus, children and what to do. In verse 1, Paul addresses children. This letter would have been written as a letter and then read to the church. And so there is an assumption built into this section, namely that when you're reading this letter, there would be children who would be in the gathering together listening to this instruction and it would form their behavior. Paul addresses them directly. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. The word for children here is not primarily one of age, rather it's one of relationship. The word for children is relational. Therefore, every single person in this room who has parents is addressed in this text. It's not just for little children, it's for all who are children. All children who can hear and understand this command that is offered to them. They are addressed in the church gathering because they are expected to be a part of the church. Part of the reason we as a church do family Sundays is because we want to occasionally ensure that we are representing the body of Christ and not just the adults in Christ relegating our children to their own thing. We like the sound of babies cooing as they remind us of some things. They, we like the sound of them crying out as a reminder that we too need to cry out occasionally. Children are not an inconvenience. They are a blessing because we are a family. And in the early church, Paul was addressing children because they were expected to be in that gathering. He says to those children, so this is for you if you are a child, if you've got parents at all, this is for you, obey your parents. You must, Paul says, obey your parents, your mother and your father. Now, this command is quite different from the command that he has just given in Ephesians 5, where he talks about husbands and wives. Husbands and wives operate in the realm of submission and love, but not in the realm of obedience. 
That's important to remember because nowhere in the Bible does it say, wives, you are to obey your husbands. Rather, the New Testament speaks as wives submitting to their husbands. And submission is not obedience. Submission, instead, is a voluntary yielding to a lover whose responsibility is defined in terms of constructive care. Submission is love's response to love. That's husbands and wives. I just clarify that in case we get a little wonky. But here with children, we've got something different. Children are to obey. I want you to notice here that Paul does not say, parents, your job is to force your children to obey you. He does not say that. Rather, he says, children, you need to learn to obey your parents. And you are to obey them, he says, in the Lord. Notice that this little piece that Paul adds, in the Lord. Why? Because all obedience to your parents is done as part of your discipleship to Jesus. You obey your parents, and sometimes when that, when that is difficult, you do it because God has called you to, because you are a disciple of Jesus. Paul does not say, children, obey your parents, do what they tell you because they have authority over you. No, he says you obey your parents because it is one of the ways that you obey Christ. And Paul says, it's right. It's the right thing to do. It's right by nature. If you look around the world, you will see the obedience of children to their parents in the natural order. Young animals follow the instructions of their parents. And yet so many parents today get this backwards. So many in Los Angeles today are tempted to think that it's a parent's job to obey their children, to keep them happy, to keep things peaceful. But that doesn't work. Children need instruction. I imagine that like us, you have probably sent your children to some kinds of lessons. Our kids have done piano lessons and recently swim lessons. And right now we've got one of our kids in skateboarding lessons. We teach them lessons so they can learn things. But I am 100% certain that not a single person in this room has ever sent your kids to take a lesson or a class on how to be selfish. I am positive that none of you have sent your kids to disobedience school. And somehow... Some way, they're so good at it. By nature, our children are sinful. They are selfish. They are self-centered. We are born as little, beautiful bundles of sin. And we need to be taught how to be holy like our Heavenly Father. Children need examples to follow. They need loving leadership. And Paul says it's the right thing to do. But why is it right? Paul lays a foundation in verse 2. Notice in verse 2, he quotes the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment, Paul says, with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Obedience is connected to honor. Now, you may be familiar with the Ten Commandments. They're the Moses received the Ten Commandments, gave them to Israel. They're wonderful. We should continue to listen to them uh, uh, today and to abide by them today. And it back, all the way back in Exodus, if we jump back, you'll see in Exodus chapter 20 a list of the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus 20 verse 12, you get this commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And it is the first commandment in the Ten Commandments that comes with a promise. Earlier, the second commandment comes with a description of God's mercy and grace. But here you get a promise in Exodus 20. And it's honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. 
What does Paul do? He takes this command, which is given to Israel, and the promise that their, that their lives would be long in the land God was given them, and instead Paul universalizes this truth. He says in Ephesians 6 that it will go well with you and that you may live long in the land, not specifically the land of Canaan, that applied to Israel, but to any land you find yourself in. There is a universal promise. If you want to have things go well for you, it starts by listening to those who God has put in authority over you. And for Paul, obedience is directly connected to honor. Do you see how he does that? He says, obey your parents, honor them. Honor them is the commandment. If you want to honor your parents, it starts by doing what they tell you to do. So if you live with parents, middle school, high school students, and some college students in the room, if you want to show your mom and dad that you honor, to the, if you, that you honor them, start by listening to them. Do what they tell you to do. Do it as an extension of your obedience to Christ who has placed them over you. If you don't live with your parents anymore, which describes many of you in the room, you too are called to honor your parents. You want to honor your parents by treating them with respect and by caring for them as they age. But why is Paul connecting it to this promise? Why is there a promise attached to it? Well, he's saying that for Israel, in the same way that it came with benefits, it comes with benefits in our society as well. It is good for society and for communities to teach their children to honor, to obey their parents. Children, when you listen to your parents, you demonstrate that you don't know everything. You demonstrate that you are still learning. You demonstrate to the world that you are not the authority of you. And you demonstrate that you receive the authority that God has put in your life. Much of our parenting philosophy today has been shaped by an 18th century French philosopher named Rousseau. And Rousseau essentially taught that children are blank slates, that they're innocent. And that what happens is that adults come in and mess the children up. So he said that what we're supposed to do is kind of get out of the way. Let children be children. Let them perform as themselves, lest we corrupt them. That was a sort of strange criticism coming from Rousseau, a man who dropped five of his illegitimate children off at the orphanage soon after they were born. Later in Rousseau's life, he admitted, I think I know man, but as far as for men, I know them not. Kids, sometimes you're not going to understand why your parents are asking you to do what you, they're asking you to do. You go through strange phases that most adults in this room could talk pretty openly about. It goes something like this. When you're little, you're pretty certain that your parents know everything. You can't even imagine something that they don't know. You see them as wise. And as you get a little bit older, you very quickly begin to believe that your parents don't know anything. And that maybe you know everything. After all, you've got access to technology and the opinions of others. As you get even a little bit older, I promise you, you'll begin to suspect that your parents knew more than you thought they did. And by the time that you're up in your old age, many of you, most of you, if not all of you, will marvel at some of the wisdom that your parents had. Children, obey your parents. Do what they tell you to do. Because in obeying them, you are obeying Christ. So we need children to obey. But if we're going to have children who obey... We need parents who will parent in accordance with the character of God. So Paul turns to parents. Notice, secondly, parents, what not to do. Beginning in verse 4, the first part of verse 4, Paul starts directly with the father. Why? Why does he start with the father, and why does he start with don'ts? 
Children are to obey mom and dad. He made that clear in the verse prior. But here, Paul wants to highlight that dads are to be the leaders in their homes. And so notice that children have obligations, but so do parents. Kids, you can pay attention now, but you're off the hook. Parents, put your listening ears on. You have obligations to your children, starting parents and specifically fathers, not to provoke your children. Now, when Paul was writing this, he was writing in a society that was familiar with a Roman concept called patria potestas. In Roman culture, fathers had near unlimited power. The 12 tables, which sort of lays out Roman law, said that fathers could choose at will to keep or discard a child. So sometimes what happens is that a a, a wife would have a child and she would take that infant and she would bring the infant and she would lay the infant at the foot of the father. And the father would look at the infant. And if for any reason the father did not want to keep that child, he would not pick up the child and that child would be discarded, left to be exposed to be killed. But if the father picked up the child, it would, it would symbolize that that father was going to take responsibility of that child. Patria, potestas, declared that parents are the sole authority of children, that they have complete and total responsibility and authority even to the point of killing their own children if necessary. So what does Paul do to a society that has said that parents, specifically fathers, have complete and total authority? He writes to a church and says, you're Christians, I don't want you thinking like the world. You have obligations to your children. Your, as fathers, you do not have unlimited power. This is a radical statement at the time. He doesn't start with power over the children. He starts with your duties to your children. Don't provoke your children to anger. This is for dads and for moms. What does this look like? Parents, do not excessively punish your children. Do not be harsh with your demands on their lives and on their behaviors. Parents, Do not abuse your authority just because you are a parent. Do not treat your children with a sense of arbitrariness. Do not nag at them and condemn them. Do not humiliate them. Do not be insensitive towards them. How do we as parents do this? How do we fail and provoke our children to anger? When we say one thing and we do another. When we always blame our children and never praise them. When we are inconsistent in our discipline. When we make promises and we do not keep them. When we show favoritism to one of our children over the other. Or sometimes... When we treat with great levity what our children experience as very important and serious. Some of us fail because we communicate to our children that we don't have time for them. That when we, by our actions and attitudes, demonstrate that we'd rather be anywhere else than with them. Or maybe for many of us, if I could just speak extraordinarily practically, when we give our children the impression that we'd rather be on this than with them. Or we'd rather be at the office. Or we'd rather be by ourselves. Your children are watching you. And they are learning Not just to do what you tell them to do. Don't miss this. They are learning to love what you love. So the most important thing that you bring to the table in your own home is your own love for God and your love for your children and your neighbors. 
Because your kids will love what you show them to love. Too many parents think that the goal of parenting is to get their kids to behave rightly, to do the right thing. That is not your number one job. Your number one job is to get them to love the right things. More on that in a minute. So don't provoke them. Children, obey your parents. But children are humans made in the very image and likeness of God. And so they are not to be manipulated, exploited, or crushed. When Paul is writing about household codes, he does it here in Ephesians. He'll do it again in the book of Colossians. Here, I want you to see what he says in Colossians. It's very similar. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. It's almost like what Paul is saying is that the provoking of our children leads to them being discouraged. Therefore, the opposite of what he is calling us to do is to encourage our children. Encourage your children. Your parents need, your children need a lot of no. A lot of no. We as parents should say no to our kids far more than we do. But they need way more praise and way more encouragement than they need no. So Paul says, don't provoke your kids to anger. And then he turns and says what we are to do. Parents, what to do? He gives a big but in verse, back half of verse 4. He says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word discipline here means training, and it means education. I can't even begin. I could spend two weeks on just unpacking this one word. Because this word right here is the word paideia. And the word paideia doesn't mean knowledge though it includes knowledge. Paideia, in the classical Greek sense, was a system of education and of training. It included grammar and rhetoric and poetry and music and mathematics and geography and natural history and astronomy and the physical sciences and the history of society and ethics and morality and philosophy. It was, it was kind of a broad term which encompassed a sort of universal and complete pedagogical course of study necessary to produce a well-rounded, fully educated citizen. If I were to sum this one word up, it probably means something like parents enculturate your children in the ways of God. Enculturate them in the ways of God. Which doesn't mean learn facts. We do the catechism as a family, and we do it as a church. And it's very important that our kids know the right things. But let me be very clear with you. Your job as a parent is not to treat your children as information machines, where in which you stuff in the right questions and answers, and then you get the right information out. Your job is not to build children who know the right things, or even know the right things to do. Your job as parents is to build loving, desiring, pursuing children who see the world as Christian and love the right things. If you only leave with one thing in mind, I hope this is it. Your job as a parent is to get your kids to love the right things. Not to know the right things. Not to do the right things. Those are both included. But to love the right things. Too many parents attempt to control the behavior of their children and they miss out that their kids are desiring beings. Your job as a parent is to help them love the right things, which means you've got to love the right things. You have to, as a child, see someone who loves it in order to love it. I bet you in this room are lots of people who have strange interests. And if I got deep into your interest, I would bet for many of you, the things that you love, the reason you love them is because you saw someone else love them. I was once in England during the time of the Super Bowl. And I can be honest in saying, attempting to watch the Super Bowl in England with all British people is an absolute nightmare. 
They don't understand American football at all. At all. They make fun of it constantly. Why is it stopping all the time? Why is all the commercials? When is this game going to end? What's happening? Why are they wearing so many pads? What's up with the helmets? Like, it just, they just, it was a hard, but I kept trying to show them, like, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's incredible, there's a lot to love about it, and over time, some of them actually started to take an interest. Why? Because it, sometimes it takes needing to see someone else love something for you to then be able to appreciate it. If you want your kids to love God, I don't mean to know about God. I don't mean to do the things of God. I mean to love God. You've got to love God. Show them what love of God looks like. Paul says that we are to bring them up in the paideia of the Lord. Your job is to give your kids a Jesus way of seeing the world enculturate them in the ways of God. Because let me be clear with you, there's no such thing as no enculturation. Everywhere they go, they're being enculturated. The movies they watch are telling them what to love, not just what to think. The music they listen to is telling them what to love, what to believe is true, what to believe is good, what to believe is beautiful, the books that they read, everything on the internet, the news that they watch, the schools that they go to. Parents, who is going to bring your children up in the knowledge and instruction of the Lord? God says exactly whose job it is, yours. It's your job to give your kids a Jesus way of seeing the world, which means you need a Jesus way of seeing the world. And it also means every child who is a Christian deserves a Christian education. Homeschool if you want, public school if you want, private school if you want, charter school if you want, whatever you want to do. That's not the rant. Here's the rant. No matter what you do, if your child is a Christian, they deserve to be raised up in the paideia of the Lord, and it's your job to do it. I've been reading a ton of research about what we ought to do as parents. I want to give you some practicals as we kind of pivot here. There's really just like, if you just did these four things, it would make a dramatic difference on your children. The most important thing you could do as a parent, if you want to make a difference in your kid's life, is be a repentant, grace-receiving Christian. Be a Christian. Do not give your kids the impression they need Jesus, but you don't. Be a Christian. Prioritize your faith. Secondly, prioritize your faith. Be a part of a church community. Show up regularly. Participate in the life of the body. Third, practice your faith during the week. Don't let your kids think this is a Sunday-only kind of thing. Pray around the dinner table before meals. Read a Bible story before bed. You don't need to overcomplicate it. Just show your kids that it makes a difference in the way that you interact in the world Monday through Saturday. And fourth, talk with your children about how a Christian views and sees the things they are being told is true. When you go to the movies, very few parents go watch a movie with their kids, which always have some sort of message, and just sort of like sit down with their kids and go, what was the message of that film, and how do we think about that as Christians? Do that. Teach them to think critically. Teach them to be aware that enculturation is happening everywhere. And lastly, pray for them every day and every night. But the goal is that they would love God and know God not just have more information about God. We are seeing a decline in connection to the church in the next generation. And I think part of the reason is because parents forgot it was their job. Parents prioritized the wrong things. And so there are lots of young people who walk away from the church. The two types of parents that kids almost always reject the faith of as they get older are these two types. The first is a parent who is all discipline and no love. They become the warden in their homes, teaching their kids 
what to do, what to say, when to get up, when to sleep. They teach their kids all discipline, and they never love their kids. As Christian parents, this means sometimes the kind of legalism that Steve was talking about last week. As kids get older and they notice that religion is just primarily used from their parents as a mechanism for control, they reject it. They walk away from it. But the second kind of parent who often has kids who walk away from the Lord are those who love their kids but give them no discipline. They give them all grace but no direction, no correction, no admonishment. All love and no discipline, all discipline and no love, these are not options for the Christian because we get all of our parenting wisdom from the character and nature of God. And God is the one who loves us more than we could imagine, and he is also the one who disciplines and corrects us. That's why the gospel is our only help. We have good news, brothers and sisters. God is our Father. Father is the Christian name for God. That's how God chooses to present himself to us. And he disciplines those he loves, Hebrews says. In Hebrews 12, verse 10, right after that text about God disciplining those who he loves, God says, or the text says, that they, they, those who are like human fathers, they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. God's goal in disciplining us is that we may share in the holiness of God. If you only correct your kids, you probably don't know the grace of God in your own life. If you only praise your kids, you probably don't know the magnitude of sin in your own life. But if you get the gospel right, and if you get God right, you will understand that you are sinful and need correction, and that in the midst of that correction, you are still simultaneously more loved by God than you could ever imagine. If you want to parent according to the ways of God, you must know the love and the grace and the forgiveness, the discipline, the correction, and the admonishment of God, who is love and who is just and who disciplines us that we might be like him. When you get God right, and when you love God most, your children are most likely to follow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we read a text about provoking our children, and I think all of us are guilty at times of being impatient, of being unkind, of being arbitrary, inconsistent. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our failures. Lord, you call us to raise up our children, to enculturate them in the ways of Jesus. And we fail at that too. We've allowed all kinds of other influences to help shape our children's desires to speak to them about what is true and good and beautiful. Lord, we desire to raise children, not just children who know the right things, know the answers to the right questions, but we desire to raise children who love you and who love their neighbors. And so, Lord, help us to model love of you and love of neighbor. Help us to pray for our children, to train them up in the way that they should go so that they might love the right things. It's not enough for our kids to know that Christianity is true. Help us to help them see its beauty and its goodness. So Lord, help us to live our lives before our kids in such a way that we might be able to turn to our kids and as imperfectly as we might say it, that we might say to them, kids, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
And when we fail, and we will fail every day, help us once again to drink deeply of your love and your forgiveness. For you discipline us because you love us. And you love us more than we could ever imagine. And you forgive us more often than we would ever forgive anyone else. Because you are love. And you are gracious. And you are compassionate. And you are kind. And for all those who are here this morning who do not know your kindness, your compassion. God, I pray that they would know this morning that you loved them so much that you sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to die the death that we deserve because of our sin, to die on a cross, to be buried, and to rise again, that all who would turn away from their sins and place their trust in Jesus would be reconciled to God, starting now, forever. So Lord, I pray that we would know you this morning, that we would love you this morning, and help us to discover that the greatest parenting book ever written was written by you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters,